This is Mouth Media Network, the business of being heard. Hi, I'm Nicolette, CEO and co-founder at Desiem, and I love beauty because beauty can't change the world, but we can change the way that people feel. And I feel by people feeling better, they in turn can change the world. From New York City, you're listening to Beauty Is Your Business, covering the intersection of innovation and business in the beauty industry. Hi, this is Abby Wallach. I'm the co-host of Beauty Is Your Business, and we're here today with my co-host, April Franzino. Hi, so happy to be here. And we have a fantastic guest today. Today we're here with Nicola Kilner, the CEO and co-founder of Desium, a brand and a company that we all know very well, which has an incredible cult following. So great to see you. Hi, Abby. Hi, April. Thank you for having me on. Are you in London? Is that where you're calling in from? I am, yes, in London on a, a sunny Friday afternoon. Oh, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us. You have such an incredible story to share. So I think it would be great for you to tell our audience a little bit about your background and where you began in beauty and how you moved forward with this incredible business and where it is today. So if you can take us on your journey a little bit, we'd love to hear it. Of course. So my beauty journey actually started with Boots in the UK, um, which is, of course, one of the, the biggest beauty retailers here. And I was a buyer at the time looking for innovation, new brands, new trends. And that's how I met Brandon Truex, who at the time was the founder of Indeed Labs. So we had an amazing working relationship. We launched Indeed at Boots. It was very successful. And then one day Brandon left Indeed. And I remember just being almost heartbroken about this person that I'd built this amazing working relationship with had suddenly kind of disappeared. So anyway, we kept in touch. And that's when he shared he wanted to start Desiem. He wanted to do 10 things at once. He wanted to try and change the industry. Um, he wanted to build an ecosystem and do everything in-house. And at this point, I'd been at Boots for, I think, probably five or six years. Um, and I was ready for a change. And I'd always been interested in joining a startup and kind of seeing how now, that would be, you know, the complete polar opposite to working for a big corporate retailer. And so that's how Desium started back in 2013. Desium was from the Latin word for the number 10. So the idea was to build 10 brands at once. And again, the thinking behind this was, you know, Brandon by this point had launched a few different beauty brands. And one thing he'd really learned is, you know, you can come up with what you think is an amazing idea or an amazing invention. But actually, it all just depends on what the consumers want. And if you do research, you know, consumers might tell you they love something, but actually until you've launched it, until actually actually it's kind of running its course you don't really know how it's going to really behave so he said actually we have this ecosystem and we set up our own factory our own labs we bring our own scientists in house let's just do everything to really allow us to kind of be more agile to really serve what our audience wants we just got started we started launching different brands and I think you know what's interesting for people to know is The Ordinary which is of course our most successful brand actually was our 11th brand to launch and um, so we've got many brands that sadly now in the graveyard they didn't quite make stand the test of time and we've got different brands at kind of different levels of success um, but you know really setting up the ecosystem in that way I think really allowed us to try many different things. Wow that's such an incredible thought process back then when you began. So interestingly enough, so you have 11 brands today, is that correct? We have six brands today. Some didn't survive. Isn't that interesting? So when you look at the brands today, I'm curious to know the success factor. What has made these brands catapult to that next level as opposed to the ones that did end up going to the graveyard, so to speak, because they, whatever you do, it takes so much time and effort and heavy lifting, right? We all know how hard it is to launch a brand. What would you say are the few things, maybe top three to five that you can share with our audience that have made these brands truly successful? It's interesting because, you know, hindsight's a wonderful thing. And with The Ordinary, which was clearly our most successful brand, 
we didn't launch this ever thinking it would be a commercial success. We actually launched The Ordinary to make a marketing point because Neod, uh, which is our kind of advanced skincare brand, you know, we truly know the innovation and the science that goes into those products that we would get frustrated when we would see Neod products compared to other brands out there in the market. And it wasn't that other products weren't good. It was that other brands were shouting about a a vitamin C formula being some kind of new breakthrough when actually it was a technology that has been around for 20 years and they're charging $90 when actually the price should be $5. So the ordinary was launched to actually make this point to say, you know, you look at the healthcare industry, if you have a headache, you want to go and buy aspirin, you go to the pharmacy, you'll spend maybe $5 on, on aspirin. You never walk into a pharmacy and presented with effectively the same ingredient, but at a $5 price point, $50 price point, and $500 price point, which is what happens in the world of beauty. So we launched The Ordinary not to be a commercial brand, but just to make the point, we hoped people would say, well, if they're selling that product for $5, that must mean Neod really is amazing. And actually, let me look into Neod. So now I can tell you why The Ordinary was a success. And, you know, I think it was really about the transparency and it was around the communication, efficacy, having a more accessible price point. But they weren't the things that we necessarily had in mind because, again, we didn't launch that brand ever thinking it was going to be the success it is today. Wow. It's such like a radically simple way of looking at the industry. It's one of those things that, of course, that should be the case, right? Because like you said, so many ingredients, they don't need to be priced and formulas don't need to be priced the way they are. And so how did you go about from the ground up building that your own labs and starting this company in a revolutionary way? And what did you do differently than other companies may do? Well, I guess we've moved offices quite a few times because I think that comes with the, with the growth and especially when we're trying to do everything in-house. And um, I think allowing us to have everything in-house has always just allowed us, I think, to do more for each brand. And especially when it comes to supply, you know, having our own factory is something that at times has definitely probably caused a struggle. And I think any of our followers will know how many stock challenges we've had. But you see, the alternative with using a third party manufacturer is you, again, come up with a product, come up with a concept, and you have to commit to a certain amount of units with that third party manufacturer. So you might have to order a line of 10,000 units of a product that you then launch. And actually, nobody likes it. Nobody has your same sense of the view. And then you're going to be stuck with all of this stock that nobody actually wants. And maybe there's another product where you thought nobody would want it. So you've just made a thousand and that sold out within a day. And now the third party manufacturer have committed their time to other brands. And actually, I think sometimes supply can can actually be what cripples new startup brands because you end up having to push the product that you have the most stock of. And again, if you've backed the wrong product, you're then pushing a product that actually people don't necessarily want or they don't necessarily like. So I think by having the manufacturing in-house, it really allowed us to keep that agility. There's many ingredients in, in cosmetic formulations that are common across different products. So actually, you can keep packaging for the ordinary. The glass bottles, we have a number glass bottle, we have a transparent glass bottle, but actually that one component can do multiple different products. So I think always having that flexibility by doing our own manufacturing meant that actually we could follow where demand was so that actually we were always pushing the product that was right for the consumer. So I think just kind of taking these different approaches, I think is kind of what really gave us the agility, which I think has been so important in kind of developing where we've got to today. That's so interesting. It was very forward thinking that all those years ago to head in that direction, I'm curious, when you launched The Ordinary, did you originally think of these brands as specific to -to direct-to-consumer or were you thinking wider distribution at retail? How did you go about launching The Ordinary? And I love what you're saying about the smaller quantities because you're right, the consumer will dictate what they want. It's never going to be about what we want, of course. With April's expertise, you know, they all follow her so because she's the beauty expert and editor. But I'm just curious, what was your strategy moving into the world? And when you say that you're focused on the consumer, how did you tackle that? Was it D to C? Was it going at to retail? I know you have your own stores today. What was your thought process and how did you build that out? 
Now, I think one thing I did see, I mean, we're a fairly sizable company now, but it still feels like we were a startup only yesterday. The reality is we never created a strategy. We never created a business plan. We can look back and think, actually, things worked out in a good way as if we had planned it. But, you know, when you're a startup, you're sometimes at the mercy of others. And that can often dictate your plan. And, you know, we probably made mistakes in the early days because we probably let retailers have too much power. And again, it's probably a good thing by the time it came around to the ordinary, we were three years old um, Desium, we had other brands. So it allowed us actually to have a little bit more courage, I think, to say no when things weren't the right things for us. But I mean, for us, we have always done exceptionally well online, um, not just on our own website, but actually with online platforms. And I think partly that's because of education. I think especially on the ordinary, people want to read about the ingredient, they want to learn, they want to know what it can be used with what it shouldn't be used with. Maybe they've read a review online, they've watched a video on YouTube, they've seen it on someone's Instagram. I think we live in a very digital era. So I think for us, it's just natural. That's where uh, so much of our demand has come from. But I think the other reason why we have always won very well online is because online can move much quicker than bricks and mortar. Again, in the early days when we were kind of launching products quickly, we were coming to market, this demand was kind of just rising through this organic social community that was really building it allowed us to actually just get the distribution and it moved much quicker and I think now we're becoming more established we now have amazing bricks and mortar partners especially with Ulta with Sephora we've got more expansions coming with them but you know these are things that take time where in the early days we were just running with it and kind of working with partners that could move as quickly as we could. That's so interesting to see how now you're in so many different places. And it makes me wonder, when the brand was in its infancy, was there a specific target audience that you were going for? If so, has that changed over time? And how has that sort of evolved? So one thing Brandon always used to say is, before we get a million people to like us, we first have to get a thousand people to love us. And I think always having that focus on actually let's find our core audience and make sure that they fall head over heels in love with everything we're doing. And then actually the good things will start to spread and we'll kind of gain a a wider audience that way. So I think that was kind of always more of the focus. We've never believed in targeting a particular gender or age group. We're just big believers in let's make good products and there'll be good humans out there that kind of want to merge. And I think what's really nice now, I think that there's an audience that really cares around how businesses treat their people, how businesses treat their partners, their suppliers, the planet. And I'd like to think people see what we're doing and look, there's areas we could still be doing better with. And you know, something we're open with on the website, if you want to look at our sustainability pages, we'll tell you what we're doing, but actually what we want to do. And you know, there's still a journey to get there. But I think for me, that's one of the nice things now knowing that actually we have an audience that really cares and really appreciates that we want to do more good. Hmm. That's so thoughtful and meaningful in the way that you've evolved as a brand, as a business, as a community. I love the community aspect of the brand and the idea of, you're right, find a thousand people to fall in love head over heels. I think in the industry per se, a lot of it is about speed to market and building something as quickly as you can But where does that ultimately leave you, right? So if people really fall in love with a brand and and the founders and the whole idea of it, I think there's more longevity today, don't you, in terms of how you can move forward? Because there's so much product out there. You know, how do people ultimately decide? How in touch are you with your community? Is it very socially active or do they share what they love with you, the things that they like, they dislike? How much does that lead you in your R&D process to continue to innovate and evolve? So, you know, we listen all the time to our consumers and whether that's what our audience is saying on our Instagram posts or on Facebook, you know, one of our fans in in Spain, Jo, she set up a Facebook group, The Ordinary Chat Room, which has almost 200,000 members in now. And this is completely independent from us. But, you know, this is just this community of ordinary fans just sharing their regimes, sharing their tips, sharing their recommendations. Uh, So we're always in there looking. But, you know, when it comes to R&D, we always say there's, there's two different pools we're looking at. It's the things consumers are telling us they want, but we also have to find the things that consumers don't even know they want yet because actually there's new technologies, there's new innovations. So actually let's make sure we're also on behalf of everyone having that eye out in terms of what is to come so we can surprise and give them options of things that they maybe never knew that they did want. 
I love that. In terms of innovation, because I know you sort of re-engineered the thought process of skincare. By the way, I love the ordinary because it speaks to everybody. It's inspirational, but it's also aspirational, right? How did you re-engineer and your thought process in the innovation process? Where are you at today and where are you headed in the future? I know you're focused on sustainability and the glass bottles and all of those things. But in terms of the actual product, because you do have your own manufacturing facility, what are your goals? How do you think about that with your team and your chemists? You don't have to give us trade secrets, but I think it's very helpful information for people who are in the skincare world to understand that. And you've kind of hit the mark with your business, which is so exciting. You know, I think for us, I mean, innovation when it comes to products, I think the thing that we have always done, which I think is different to many other beauty companies, we've always said that actually NPD products innovation should sit within the science team with the lab team and not with the brand or marketing team, which I think would be more typical because if you sit it in your science team, then it's always going to start with science. And if you sit it with more of a brand marketing team, then naturally it's always going to sit more with what the trend forecast is saying and and the problem is if you follow trends you're doing what everyone else is doing uh but you know we still have far less resources than all the big conglomerates out there so actually we're just going to be following them but maybe a few steps behind whereas when you sit it within your scientific team and ignore all the trends i like to think that almost you can become the creator of trends and actually you know because you're thinking differently to everyone else and actually you know some things won't take off but there may be other things you do that a year later you start to see on on those same trend reports you've ignored but you've already done that and accomplished it. I'm very curious about you mentioned some of the brands have been more successful obviously than others what were some that surprised you along the way some successes or some ones that didn't take off the way that you anticipated were there any surprises there along the way? I won't spend too long on it, but clearly the ordinary was the the biggest surprise because we never expected it to really be a commercial brand for us. So that one's just what blew us completely away. And but you see, you know, if you ask a lot of the Decium team, we would say Neod is our kind of crown jewel. It's the one that we are so proud of. The approach of Neod is to focus on skin health, the longevity of our, our skin. And Neod, if you think about Apple iPhone, there's always new phones coming out, you get the software updates, because actually technology and innovation is always progressing. And that's what the Neod formulas do. You know, these formulas don't stay the same. Every year they're updating because new technologies come out, new actors come out. And Neil's commitment is to always stay at the forefront of those innovations. It's a much more complicated message to deliver. So for us, the fact that Neil is a minuscule portion of of the ordinary can be frustrating at times. But again, it's just one of those brands where I think it will just take longer for people to fall in love. And that's okay because, you know, we're we're here to stay. We have the whole Decium umbrella. So yes, the ordinary is by far the biggest surprise in terms of success. Amazing. Can you tell us a little bit more about the product portfolio, how it started, specifically The Ordinary, since that's been the blockbuster of your portfolio? What did you start with? And then how has the brand grown and why as time has gone on? So, you know, The Ordinary started just with a a collection of those key skincare ingredients from retinols, vitamin Cs, different acids, different oils, but ingredients where I think we felt like these were very effective ingredients that we put into very effective formulations. And again, we were respectful for if you see a product in an amber bottle, it means it's because it's sensitive to sunlight. So, you know, thinking through all of the different components that could affect these ingredients and just really bringing them at an accessible price point. And again, actually, you know, one of the the other kind of innovation points around the ordinary, which was not necessarily to do with the formulations themselves, but actually even the positioning. We were very focused that even though these price points are going to be honest price points, which are accessible price points, we want this to be positioned as a luxury brand because luxury should no longer be defined by price point. Luxury should be defined by authenticity and the story. And I think that's something that people really believe in now. You can find The Ordinary in Harrods, Selfridges, Harvey Nichols, some of the top department stores in the world in their beauty halls right next to Chanel, Tom Ford. And for us, that was kind of a big piece of the innovation, not just the products, but actually let's just kind of re- reinvent this wheel in, in kind of multiple different ways. But, you know, the, back to the product line, sorry, on The Ordinary. So we, we kind of started with those. And then again, it's expanded into different formulations as in different kind of 
base textures of which those actors would be in. We've expanded into colours. We've now launched concealers this year. We have some products in hair care launching early in 2022. We already have, sorry, one hair product, our, our scalp hair density product. But really, it's just around bringing those effective formulations at really honest price points and just being transparent about the ingredients that are within there. Let's buzz about product claims. I'm Jessica Quick of Buzz Beauty, and I'm here with Denise Dente, my colleague. Hi, Jessica. I'm excited to talk about product claims. It's a fun subject. It can be, definitely. Uh, Specifically, cosmetic claims versus marketing copy. Here in the U.S., we use words like moisturizes the skin, reduces the appearance, or prevents dot, dot, dot. But in other countries, those are actually considered cosmetic claims. It could even be dependent on what words you actually select. The ones you mentioned sure seem like common ways to explain product performance or benefits, yet in places like Europe, it could require evidence from a consumer perception study or even results from a clinical study. This is why we recommend using a regulatory or legal professional in the area that you want to sell your product. They should review marketing copy on your packaging, digital assets, advertising, or websites. I know we are often asked by brands, how can they be globally compliant? And there are two options. One, you can take off any copy that could be deemed a claim. I don't love this one because then that really means that you end up taking away your product messaging. It becomes very basic and really your reason to buy. So the other option is to create different packaging, digital assets, and marketing materials for the country or region you want to go into. But I do understand there's a cost to that. Yes. And one of the things that we like to do is if you want to retain your claims, we like to collaborate with a substantiation company that is based in the UK. And it's not scary or hard. You just need to know that there are differences in how you can market your product. And words really do matter. So if you want to know more about consumer claims internationally, we really love the YouTube videos that Kara Smith from Aiton Global Research does. You can check those out, or you can head on over to buzzbeauty.com and check out our blog or what we like to call our diary. I was going to ask you more specifically about your efficacy testing. That's a very big part of everything that we do in beauty. And how much do you do in advance? Do you do with focus groups before you actually bring something to market? And today with the no-no list, there's so much information that everyone needs to know and nothing, everything is um, in the public domain, so to speak. And people ask questions, which is great. I'm just curious, how much do you delve into the testing process and when you can decide that something's ready to go to market? And then on top of it, do you focus group? Do you share it with different communities to assess before you go into production? It's just those are things that come to mind because I know the back end process with manufacturing. It's a huge commitment. You're right. Whenever you put something into the market, I think people that are founders and in the beauty industry are trying to create smaller runs so they can test it and try it. So they don't run into the expense and the risk. When you're a small company, it is a big risk. So how have you tackled that? So, you know, testing takes a lot of time and and a lot of resources for sure. And actually, it's something we're very passionate about. We're actually just at the moment building our own microbiology lab at the moment because we want to bring even more of the testing process in-house. So every product goes through all the rigorous safety testing and and everything that we have to do. I mean, in terms of efficacy testing, it depends on the the product and which brand it is. Because, you know, something in the ordinary, there would be some ingredients out there where, again, we often look at the healthcare industry because I think it's the kind of industry that people understand the most sometimes to make these comparisons. But if you go back, you have a headache, you have aspirin. There's standard approved understanding of what that ingredient will do at a certain concentration. And actually that efficacy is already done. And that's, again, part of the the whole model of the ordinary. That's why some of these formulations can get out quickly, because actually we can rely on if we do that formula at that concentration where it's already been an agreed um, result. 
Where it gets more complicated is, of course, when we start mixing technologies together and we need to make sure that actually there's no negative consequence of using two different actives together and actually you need to be having that result plus that result, hopefully a bit more in it and making sure it's not the opposite to happen. So most of our testing happens in-house. And in terms of focus groups, we we always have a huge panel within our own company who all try the products. And again, we're making sure it's touching lots of different skin types, age types all over. They get shipped to kind of our offices all over the world. We tend to do more of that than consumer. It's always difficult with consumer because we've often found that people react differently when they're trying a product to actually if they've spent $20 of their hard-earned money on a product. So we actually say as well, you know, once we've kind of been through all of this, sometimes it's just a case of launching the product and maybe that's just launching on DTC to begin with. And especially if this was something we did much more in the early days of Decium. Let's launch products and let's get the feedback. And if things need tweaking along the way, that's okay. Because I think sometimes if you sit on something for too long, you can spend forever trying to perfect it, but then you can always make tweaks, you can always kind of improve things. So I think just getting the right balance. But again, you know, our quality team who are based within our manufacturing, who are are in charge of the, well, the quality, the efficacy, the safety of every product that leaves Decium, you know, they are second to none, they're critical. We have over 50 people working in in that department now to ensure that actually everything we do is up to our standards always. Wow, that is so impressive. It really is. Not every company does that, we know, and especially doesn't have their own labs and offers the quality for such a great value. So it's so interesting to me that the positioning of the brand in the U.S. market in terms of retail, even though the price point is what we would call like a drugstore or a mass price point, that the store, you know, the retailers themselves are Sephora and Ulta, which are more high-end retailers. So was that something that the retailers themselves found unusual? Was there any like barrier to entry there bringing the lower price products that even though the formulas and the technology and the packaging is more of a luxury brand, was there any barrier to entry in terms of getting into those retailers when you were approaching that? I think, you know, the the early days, so we launched The Ordinary at the latter end of 2016. And I think some of the first retailers that we started talking to, it was a conversation. It, It didn't come easy trying to convince people that we wanted this to kind of sit within premium. So I think by the time the US market for us launched a little bit later, so I think by that point, they had already seen this more aspirational positioning that we had secured for the brand. So actually those conversations were much easier and both Sephora and Ultra have been phenomenal partners. I think they truly put the audience at the heart of what they do. And I think, you know, it's something we do too. So I think there's always synergies along the way. Consumers today don't just want to buy a product. They want to join a brand. They want to believe in the brand. And I think there are so many more factors now that define luxury and I think it's amazing to see retailers actually starting to own that not all of them do yet and I think it's definitely leading in beauty and I hope it kind of starts to come into some other industries too but I think it's just such a an important message that price point doesn't define luxury anymore it it never should have but it, it definitely doesn't today So Nicola, this has been such an incredible opportunity to really get the inside scoop and access about DCM and the journey that you've been on. It's really rather incredible that you've covered so much ground and have achieved just such success. So congratulations to you and your incredible team. Love to talk a little bit about the SD Lauder partnership and how that has evolved for you, because that's been sort of a big sensation in the industry and, you know, where it began and then how it moved to the next level. So we were fortunate for um, Estee Lauder companies to become a minority investor of ours in 2017. I think The Ordinary was about eight months old at the time, so really still in the infancy. So they took on a minority stake. We built this amazing relationship where they It's like having a very well-connected, well-knowledged aunt or uncle where you can call them if you need help, if you need a connection, uh, normally more relating to the operational side of the business. But actually, you know, they really kind of just stood from the side and, you know, they always used to say, we love what you're doing. That's why we're investing in you. So we don't want to touch you. (laughs) Like You keep doing what you're doing and we're just going to watch happily from the sidelines. And so the relationship has always been, you know, incredibly supportive and I think incredibly respectful both ways when the conversations happen. And obviously they have 
uh, now increased uh, to become a majority owner with the view of taking full ownership in three years time. I think it was something that, you know, we all welcomed. It wasn't something that happened overnight. We've really got to know the team. I think, you know, some of the people we have met at ELC are incredible leaders, all the way up to Leonard, who is just inspirational. Fabrizio, they just are generous with their time. They're generous with their words. And I think it's just a, a really nice partnership. I think for us and you know, the fast growth that we have achieved over the years, I think we've always been very well equipped on kind of the, the brand side and the, and the product side. It takes a lot of infrastructure stuff to kind of cope with the growth we've seen. So that's really where they've been invaluable, you know, ringing, getting some of their, their guidance on some of the more operational aspects. That's amazing. I feel like that's the ideal partnership, it sounds like. And I'm curious to see where you see the company going in the next couple of years. Like, what are your goals for growth? Their growth has been so fast and so expansive in such a short period of time. So what's next for the brand as a whole and then the individual brands? So, you know, really for us, it's global expansion is a big focus over the next couple of years. I think the Destiem, but particularly the Ordinary, has really grown on social, it's grown online, it's grown through communities. And there's no global borders on communities. So it means actually the demand is really all over the world. But, you know, we're in a place where through our website, we can ship to most countries now. But actually, there are many countries where we really don't have a presence. And so to actually make ourselves more accessible is really important, especially, you know, markets like Middle East, markets like India, South America. Uh, There are so many places now where we want to start launching in a more finding local partners. comes with having to do registration, having to add extra languages to the packaging. So again, there's, there's kind of lots of operational things we need to get in place. But I think expansion to make sure that we're remaining accessible to all of those that want to buy the, the ordinary or other Destian products is really important. Amazing. Well, we can't wait to see how it continues to grow. So when I stumbled across the DCM store, it was so impressive. Can you share when you decided to do that and how it ultimately evolved and where you're at on that path for your own freestanding stores today, especially with what the world and where it's at? Absolutely. So we have over 30 of our own stores uh, all around the world, um, US, Canada, Australia, uh, UK. It's an area we want to expand because I think having our own stores, it just allows a consumer to come in and really have that full Decium experience for them to, we'd rather look at our stores as a education center rather than a retail environment as such, because I think people are loving having conversations around ingredients, they're loving learning. Um, And I think having those environments really helps us to showcase a brand in the way that's really important to us because ultimately everything in in our stores is under our control when you work with retail partners you have to respect their branding too so you're always trying to kind of find the right compromises so it's just important and I think we are a very design focused brand I'm actually very proud of that the team they actually just won one of the Paris design awards we just learned this week for us that sometimes means more than some of the other awards we've, we've been lucky to win Congratulations. Your design is really stunning. It's spectacular. It's great. It's so chic. It's so cool. I love it. Congratulations. You deserve it. The team do such an amazing job. I think you feel that in in the stores. And obviously, you know, COVID hitting was incredibly hard. And we were very fortunate to kind of keep we knew this wasn't going to be something that was going to go away within you know a couple of weeks. So we quickly pivoted and we got online and um, virtual consultations up so that actually all of the retail team could work throughout the entire pandemic. We didn't have to lay off anyone. We managed to secure all roles. And actually, it's really nice because it allowed more consumers. You know, we always had customers could email us and kind of get advice that way. But suddenly to have 300 retail people at home uh, on their computers ready to give advice uh, actually allowed us to kind of open that up all all around the world so even though most festivals are reopened now so the team are back working in store it's something that we do want to really reinstate again because I think it had a a lot of value and I think you know retail is always going to have a place in the future because people still like those experiences those touch points those conversations And we're still looking at opening new stores, you know, at the moment we're looking in Berlin, we're looking in Paris as this kind of new countries and new cities we would like our Decium stores to appear in. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing.
have you taken a look at StoryDot yet? Every brand and every product has a story to tell. And you can't successfully sell that brand or product without telling the story. StoryDot delivers your story wherever you want it to be heard. You can meet your customers at each point in their journey, connecting the dots between your business and the consumer to enhance engagement, experience, and conversion. I encourage you to take a look at StoryDot at StoryDot.com. That's S-T-O-R-I-D-O-T dot com. And now it's hitting the pan. So it's at this point in the show where we'd love to ask you, Nicola, a few personal questions. And we spin the chair, the salon chair. We're in my kitchen right now, so I'm going to just make it the kitchen chair. April, if that's okay, I'm going to stand up and spin the kitchen chair around. And it's going to land on April. So you'll ask the first question. Okay. I'm so curious, Nicola. Obviously, you're from the UK originally. You probably travel all the time for work. But what's the place that you love most in the world? Where would you want to spend your time? It could be home, if that's the case. <laughs> I mean, I have two young children. I have a, a two-year-old daughter and an eight-month-old baby boy. So definitely wherever my children are. You know, I think recently we've had some amazing memories. I think just in the Hamptons was somewhere where I spent a lot of time in New York and in Toronto and kind of around that area. So we spent a few weekends kind of going up to Montauk, to Gurney's. So I think that's why I have some amazing memories. But yeah, really anywhere with my my husband and my two children. I love that. I just got back from Gurney's. <laughs> oh, I love it there. You know, there's something, I love all of the different areas of the Hamptons. I've been going since I'm little, but there's something about Montauk that just feels so natural and organic and cool, right? It really does. In a short trip, you can just feel so far away from the city, which I love. Because it's the end of the world as we know it, <laughs> right? Don't they call it the end? So we're going to spin the kitchen chair again, and this time it's going to land on me. Nicola, it's very fascinating to hear your story. Loved having you on the show, but it would be interesting to know, what's your beauty routine like? What do you do? Give us like the lowdown from morning, from the minute you get, you have two little boys, right? You said two little boys. One girl, one boy. Oh, one girl, one boy. Okay. So give us the a day in the life of your beauty routine and how you get it going on. Well, if you, see, if you see my in my bathroom, I have just so many bottles of everything. And, you know, there's always the core cool products I have in my routine, which would always be copper amino isolate serum from Neod, a squalene cleanser from The Ordinary. And so it's kind of a few staples. But then, you know, I feel like I always have lab samples. So it's always trying to get that balance between using the, the products I love, but then also trying the new products too. But, you know, one of the things that I've been really grateful for over the pandemic having much more time at home I feel like I've actually really been able to spend more time on my kind of skincare routine which has just been amazing because before this you know traveling all the time would be difficult with jet lag rushing out the house trying to kind of get everything ready before getting on a train or, or a flight and so I've definitely enjoyed having more time one of the things that I find now I feel like I have a little bit more of a leisurely getting ready is actually just spending a bit more time between steps because I think, you know, so often people apply, 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 you know, if they're using three different products, they, they kind of do it one after the other. Whereas actually, I feel like you can get even better results. You know, if I apply one thing and then maybe I'll brush my teeth and I'll apply another thing and then I'll do my mouthwash and then I apply another thing. So even just actually spreading some time really just helps with the absorption of each product. So I think the injection of just a bit more time has been something that I've really appreciated. And um, yeah, anything with copper peptides is the, the ingredient that I truly believe should always be in any and all skincare routines. But then the rest of it does tend to vary depending on seasonality or what I'm trying at the time, depending on what uh, new product launches we're working on. I love it. You have gorgeous skin. This is what we should be talking about all day long, right? It's so funny. You know, it's so funny that, you know, as I look at my skin, I think because I haven't been out running around New York, nothing against New York. I love New York. But, you know, the dirt, the grime, 
think about it, we've been home. I don't know. I think it's made our skin look a little bit better, not being in the sun. You know, you're right, not being out running around on the plane, on the train, wherever we're going. So there, there have, maybe there will be some real value to all being home, shut, locked up for a year and a half. You never know. It's very funny. We should do a, like a study on that. Let's go, April. You want to do it, girls? Like, that would be really good. I love that idea. So is it this point in the show where we'd love to ask you, Nicola, for a final thought and how our audience can get in touch with you? What would be the best way for them to reach out and learn more about the brands that you've launched and you? Well, I'm always very open. I, I share my email. It's going up on our, on our Desium Instagram. I'm actually on a post we're doing next week, nk at desium.com. I'm a big believer in open communication. I love to hear from people. I think it's the way we all grow just by being open to hearing other people's thoughts. And of course, my Instagram, Nicola L. Kilner, uh, or always follow us on Decium too. I, I check all the comments on the post. So that's D-E-C-I-E-M. But you know, I'm excited. I think, you know, it feels like certainly in the UK and I feel like in the US as well. I hope that we're starting to see the light uh, towards the end of the pandemic. Very excited to be able to travel again, hopefully to get over to Toronto where I had offices, I'm hoping in the next couple of months. But, you know, just feeling very grateful and excited. And I think actually the Desium for quite a long time has tried to kind of push this idea of kindness. And actually, you know, we talk about the us driving growth is so we can do more good. And I feel like this is becoming something that's becoming more asked for, actually, from an audience of more brands. And I just feel like the world is genuinely becoming a better place. And I think actually COVID's also been a driver of that. So despite all the heartbreak, I just feel in a, a very positive place about the, the coming few months and years. That's fantastic. Very, very well said. Thank you so much for joining us on the Beauty Is Your Business podcast. April, it's always fantastic having you as my co-host and sharing the stage and interviewing amazing guests. This is Abby Wallach signing off for Beauty is Your Business. Thank you. This has been Beauty is Your Business, produced by Mouth Media Network, copyright 2021. Keep in touch on Instagram and Facebook at Mouth Media Network. And find prior episodes at beautyisyourbusiness.com and wherever the best podcasts are found. Your brand message can be on this show. Email us to find out more at podcast at mouthmedianetwork.com. Thank you for listening. This is Mouth Media Network, your inside voice.